we're coming at you from uh, Monastir, Tunisia, where we're at now. This is current, uh, real world, uh, at the moment, at this very moment. Where we are. Where we are, real time. Yeah. Monastir, Tunisia. If you're curious where that is, it's North Africa, and it is North Africa hot outside. And we would be outside doing this video, but the cafe behind us played the reading of the Quran for probably, which I don't have a problem with, but they played it all morning. And then as soon as it quit, we got ready to do the video in the cockpit. They started playing cafe music. So yeah, so we're inside now. We're sorry if the lighting's weird or our faces are red because of the red furniture, but uh, here we are. So question and answers, that's why we're here um, to answer your questions. We love responding to your questions. Again, if you ever have a question during any of our videos, post it in the comment section below. You'll also find a lot of information about the video that's posted. Uh, right below the video, there's a little arrow. Uh, I'll show you in a little picture here. There's an arrow you can click. It will extend down the information. There's links to our webpage, links to our Patreon site. Uh, there's information about the songs that I put in that, that certain video. Um, and lots of information that's available about where we were and when it was actually filmed. So, so read that information. It's really good inform. Uh, read the information. It's good information. <laughs> it's good, good stuff, Maynard. <laughs> so, um, and then yeah. So this is a question answer session. We've we've added up all the questions that people keep asking, and that they submitted. If we don't attribute the question to a particular person, we still thank you all for who contributed the question, but multiple people asked those questions. So if we don't say who asked the question, then, then that's why, because a lot of people ask the same question. So first question, um, Brooke and Justin asked, if there was one thing we would do differently, what would it be? Oh, okay. So I think one thing that would um, really benefit us in, um, if we were to do this again, would to be more informed on the process of purchasing a boat in the chosen place. Um, Croatia turned out to be, I don't know, a little complicated. So, um, and maybe another thing would be not to fix everything before moving onto the boat and starting our sailing. There's a lot of places we could stop and do fixes and um, we didn't need to do everything in Croatia. Um, yeah, so maybe I would say that's it. Yeah, it would have actually been cheaper to do a lot of the work in Turkey, we found out later. Um, and so in with that uh, after forethought or what would you call it 2020 hindsight um, maybe I would have looked harder at, at boats in Turkey because purchasing there um, getting a lot of the work done but you know it still would have worked out in Croatia if we had purchased the boat and just done the minimal fixes to get it get it seaworthy which it already was um, start sailing the boat get it down to Turkey and then by the time we got through Greece into Turkey the weather would still be good and uh, we'd actually have an idea of what we wanted to upgrade to and what we wanted to fix and what we could live without fixing. Um, and so that's that's what I would have done. I think the only thing that was particular to probably getting our hands on was the fridge and freezer. Um, that would have been difficult to get in Turkey. I think Greece made it a little, e or uh, Croatia made it a little easier. And like Jen said, sailing the boat sooner, um, trying not to make it perfect right away. Um, differently that you know we saw i fell in love with this boat and there's a problem when you fall in love with a boat because then other boats don't look as good <laughs> and we saw a lot of good boats uh we saw an elon i didn't really like the elon it's more i think they tried to make it a racing boat so it wasn't as beamy as the bavarias we saw a bavaria 45 which i really thought was a beautiful boat um well laid out and and we could have it had a new engine and the company had taken care of those boats for immaculate there probably would have been minimal work had to be done on those there was actually a bavaria 50 i'll put the link to the video it'll be over here at the <laughs> top a bavaria 50 that we saw and fell in love with um, the kids fell in love with boat. this boat was already under contract um, and that boat was probably sixty thousand dollars less 
Um, and that would have given us a whole bunch more money for the cruising kitty. Uh, so that's one thing to consider. So, and then smaller, we, we really, you know, it was like, oh, we need this big of a boat to fit everybody. And then we started running into these families, like um, uh, a family from Washington, or are they from Oregon? From Washington, that uh, they had five young children and they lived on a 40 footer, which was a three cabin. And it re kind of redefined my, my idea about cruising. So we couldn't <laughs> live on a 40 footer. I was, I was told when we first started looking at boats, it had to be a 42 footer. Minimum. Minimum. So yeah. So, but we could have, we could have looked at more seriously at all of the 45s. So yeah, that's what I would have done differently. Dane asks, about our travel to Croatia and how we decided upon our boat, or how did we find it? So our travel to Croatia was was probably the cart before the horse. Um, I looked at, there were a lot of boats in the Mediterranean. First of all, uh, there's another link up here for the video on um, finding our boat. And uh, so basically the cart before the horse means that um, I looked. We looked at Spain and and Greece and Italy and and Turkey and all these places where there was a large inventory of boats, and uh, Croatia seemed to be one of the central areas accessible to those other areas by train and European travel and ferry, and there were a lot of boats there, large inventory. We needed an ex charter boat because we wanted a four cabin boat that would accommodate all the kids, and that's hard to find in the U.S. So charter boats. Uh, Mediterranean and then so to get the journey going sometimes you just need to make the first step and so what I did is I central in Croatia was split airfare was the cheapest to split compared to some of the other areas on the coastline so I went ahead and purchased tickets to Croatia and then we found an Airbnb and so that's how it went and so that that started the process so now plans were rolling. We needed to be in split by a certain date. We needed to have the house sold. We needed to move into apartment. All these things needed to happen because we were going to get on a plane and go to Croatia to buy this boat. And then how we found the boat is, and I just looked, there's so many websites, Yacht World, Yacht All, uh, Boat.com or Boats.com. But Yacht All, I think, had the biggest selection of ex-charter boats in uh, in the Mediterranean or boats in, in particular. So a lot of them, there's actually a couple European companies that had some German boats listed. So there's, there's a lot of resources online. If you just say, find uh, boats for sale, sailboats for sale, location, Google does a good job of doing all the work for you. So, and then, uh, so that's how we found this boat. We had the criteria of what we wanted in the boat. And then we just kept searching until we found a couple boats that met the criteria, started a list and then uh, started looking through those boats digitally. Um, probably, in answer to the first question, done differently, I probably would have flown over without the family, um, looked at the boats, secured the deal, or maybe Jen and I, without the kids, secured the boat, and then during the contractual process, we could have done all of that without having been in Croatia, and it wouldn't have used our, our time in Croatia. And money. And money, yeah. <laughs> so we used a lot of money waiting for the boat uh, and the contract and all these purchasing processes to go through. So, so yeah, that's different. All right, next question. Um, would we buy in Croatia again? Wow. Um, because we've already uh, skinned that cat, we would probably buy in Croatia again. Um, I don't think I'd get Jen to come with me to buy in Croatia again. Would you come? Would you do it again? Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. So, yeah. Because we're familiar with the process. So. Very familiar. And we know how to go through the process now. And if you do have questions, again, in the, the comment sections below or the description of the video, not the comment sections, you're going to find our email address for Saltwater Lanai, Vince at saltwaterlanai.com. Um, hit us up. Ask us questions about the buying process if you have particular questions. Uh, we'd love to respond to your questions. Put it in the comment sections. We love to respond to your questions in the comment sections, and it makes these Q and A uh, sessions uh, more valuable because we're answering your questions. We're not just throwing information at you that you might not want. 
Yeah. Um, another thought I had about that though is, um, I think the majority of the family was more interested in, um, sailing in the Caribbean and the Bahamas. And so maybe purchasing our boat in the area that we were most interested in starting, um, would have been uh, maybe we do that next time. So, um, yeah, I don't know. You kind of have to weigh it. Boats there were a little more expensive and, um, hauling out and fixing might have cost us more money. So at this point, like, we're not going to get to the Caribbean. Well, we are. Rebecca will see some of it, but then she's going to leave us at, after Christmas. So she won't see most of it. And that was her main thing she wanted to do on this trip. So things to consider. Yeah. And so would I consider the Caribbean now? I, I probably would, knowing that we could be on a smaller boat. The problem was finding... Uh, good four cabin boats in the Caribbean uh, that weren't destroyed in one of the major hurricanes. The, the inventory in the Caribbean is a lot smaller just because the, a lot of the older boats were destroyed on a few of the islands and so that that makes the inventory a lot smaller. So how are we funding this adventure? So we actually um, when we move into a new area like this we find out what the child labor laws are and then we actually sell the children as slaves uh, for a week or two, you know, just to do people's laundry and mop their floors and things like that. No, we're, we're just kidding. That's not legal. You know that, right? That's not legal. Okay. So I have a small retirement uh, pension from the military. Uh, I worked a lot of overtime before we left. I took every overtime shift I could. Uh, we were lucky enough to sell our house in a seller's market. Um, so we had that money and that's basically what we used to purchase the boat. That was the boat purchase, purchase money. Um, and then I was smart. We did a lot of, uh, what, like cutting back, yeah. downsizing, downsizing, um, and when you get that, that's the most important thing. And if you're watching this video and you want to learn, you're, you're sitting there and you're thinking, I could never do something like that. I'm in this, the continual rat race where I, I work just to pay the bills and, and I, I spend money to entertain myself because that's the only ten of entertainment I get. And then I have to work more to pay the bills and, and it's this horrible cycle. Um, you can do it. I started educating myself. I read a lot of books. Um, Robert Kiyosaki, Rich Dad, Poor Dad, um, and I'll actually, I'll put them in the comments below the most important books that I think were important in grooming uh, my mind into the idea that, that uh, I didn't need stuff now. The other most important thing is to, to have a vision. Um, the next video after this one, I think it is, I talk about that, having that vision, that picture in your mind of what it's going to be like uh, when you get there. Make a, a dream board, put it up on the wall. And stare at those pictures every day and say, this is why I'm working overtime. This is why I'm not going to the movies now. This is why I'm not having a six pack of beer. This is why I'm selling my $40,000 pickup truck and buying a $1,200 Hyundai um, and all these other things. You know, really adjusting your life to be able to attain the goals. And don't wait till you're our age. Do it when you're 30 something. Do it when you're 40 something. Um, don't wait. That would be my other advice. Uh, would you agree with that? Yeah. Yeah. Don't wait. We just kept putting it off. Oh, we needed to have this amount of money. We needed to have this amount of money. Um, kids needed to be older. Yeah. Kids needed to be older. The, the biggest thing is there's so many people out there sailing now with, with infants and little kids and, and teeny little budgets. And so, uh, if you really want to do it and you want to try it, make it work. You know, if the boat sinks, what a great experience, <laughs> you know? Yeah, it, well, that's what insurance life. is for. Um, you, you know, but the, my point is, if you get the worst boat in the world because you end up getting a bad deal, um, it's still going to be an experience that you will always remember. <laughs> you will never forget it. Did that you have is, something about that? That is for sure. Funding. Yes. By the way, we don't drink, so we would never buy a six-pack of beer anyway. Um <laughs> I'm talking to them. I think he's talking to the world, maybe, but... 
Next question, what was our daily routine before we moved on to a boat and what is it now? Um, your basic daily routine. We got up, we, um, we do a family devotional every morning and evening, so we do that. Then the kids are off to school, dad's off to work, uh, mom's cleaning the house, uh, doing the groceries, whatever. And then the kids get home from school we do all the run around for lessons and uh, practices and whatever the extra curricular activities we have in that season. We eat dinner and go to bed. And um, now there's some basic structure, but it's not super structured. Um, we do get up and have our family devotion still. We eat at some point three times in the day. <laughs> Four times, maybe five. <laughs> um, do some schooling. Uh, you know, boat school for the girls, the two younger ones, and then um, go explore the town. Swim if it's warm, if we're in a clean bay of water, um, whatever. So whatever floats our boat for the day. Um, yeah, so that's... That's the difference. Yeah, and the, the, I think the biggest difference is since we're not trapped in that rat race, then um, we really get to decide what we're going to do today or what we're going to do tomorrow. And, and if we want to leave and go somewhere today or we want to leave and go somewhere tomorrow or if we want to stay here an extra week, we, we try to keep the schedule open because you know, we don't know what's going to come up. We might meet somebody or family might invite us over to do some activity or something like that. Um, just a minute. Maddie, can Hi. you just wait 20 minutes till we're done with this? Okay, can I have more reading time? Yes. Oh, schedule. So, so it, it, it really changes um, every day. I mean, we might spend three hours snorkeling or playing at the beach or going for a hike or something like that. So it's like an eternal vacation. But like Jen says, we do have those things, morning devotional, evening devotional, where we read scriptures and, and pray as a family. We're very spiritual um, and very uh, dedicated to our religion. We, uh, we want to be involved in the community. We want to do uh, community projects if it's available. We want to clean the beach. Um, well, at least I do and Jen does. Sometimes the kids aren't as motivated in <laughs> those things if there's not ice cream involved um, with it. So it, it's like being on vacation. That's how I would describe it. It's like a vacation with occasional work duties. So for me, uh, Jen's schedule is a little different. I still have to mow the lawn, which includes uh, fixing things, uh, cleaning the bottom of the boat, um, doing small upgrades to things like... This week I added some screens to the to two of the bedroom windows and added a little uh, pocket to put one of the winch handles in and things like that. So it's always interesting. It's fun. If you're a handyman, a boat will keep you entertained to <laughs> and busy and busy to a great extent. So it's but it's it's worth it. OK, the next question. Get my readers on. Uh, Let's see. Mark asks, Mark, thanks for this question. How do we choose our next destination and what values were our children learned from this adventure? So right here, I'm going to insert a video of each of the kids answering this question. So now you'll get to hear from each of the kids what kind of values they've learned and things they've learned from, from this adventure. What values will we or are we learning? Uh, well, it's just really cool seeing all the, well, we haven't been out of the United States, and so it's really cool just seeing all the different cultures and the different places and how everything's set up and stuff. So, yeah. What about you, Lisa? Um, I've learned to appreciate, are we doing the, this one? Yes. yes. Okay. I've learned to appreciate new foods and clear clean water and yeah and the lakes stuff. in utah are not very They're gross. clean <laughs> They're gross. um uh i think the biggest value i've learned is patience um being in this small area with family 
can be very um, annoying. And so uh, I've definitely learned a lot more patience being stuck in a smaller area with them. So, yeah. How do we choose our next destination? A lot has to do with the wind. Before we choose our next destination, we have to kind of look at the wind patterns in the Mediterranean and decide um, we really wanted to go to Crete. But when we looked at the wind patterns and our buddy boat that we were going to travel through Greece with, things didn't kind of line up. And so, um, like now, we want to leave uh, Monastir, head up to um, Hemamet and Bizerte, and then over to, as you're looking at it, up to the bottom of Sardinia to Cagliari. Well, we have to wait for the winds to switch because normally there's a pattern that that uh, blows from the west and so later this week we've got a pattern blowing from the east so that kind of designates when when we're leaving here to go continue our journey westward and ultimately our, our journeys the Caribbean and then somewhere in the United States um, that's our near-term goal so we're spending Christmas in Puerto Rico with the kids so if any of you want to see us there shoot a message down below we'll meet you in Puerto Rico we'll give you a tour of the boat and uh, we'll say hi, maybe get a soda with you. Um, but values, I think the value I've learned, and I, I've noticed this the last few weeks, especially when I've had to, in front of, we're actually backed up to a cafe, and so all night long <laughs> and day long, people are sitting at tables right behind our boat. And so anything we do, we're kind of on display uh, here at Monastery in Tunisia. Um, and I've gotten used to be on display. I'm cool with it. But, um, for example, the intake for the air conditioner uses uh, salt water. And this bay has a lot of seagrass and plastic trash. And so every other day, something gets sucked into that intake. And I have to get dressed in my snorkel gear in front of the fans and, and <laughs> go under the boat and clean the boat off. So what, I, what I've learned from this, what value is, is to just be okay with, with uh, things happening. You know, the term stuff happens. It happens a lot on boats. And so I've become a lot less reactionary. I'm still trying to get better with not reacting to loved ones as much. But as far as things falling apart on the boat or... Or like having to go into the boat, you know, with the fan club watching me while they eat their uh, food and drink their mochaccinos. Um, I'm okay with that now. I'm okay with with changing our destination because of maintenance. I'm okay with changing the destination because of weather. And, and it's really helped me become less uptight. I used to be a really uptight person. I know it's hard for you guys to believe that, but I used to be uptight. Really uptight. <laughs> Jen? So I think one of the most important values I've learned is putting, um, I guess, less value on material items and more on experiences. And so um, that's been a great learning. Uh, it's, it's mm -hmm. probably, you know, that was scary for us back then. Now I would say I would be comfortable and I, I know the boat would be more comfortable than me in 40 knots with with just the head sail reefed a little bit of head sail out and we'd be making good time i think the most mm -hmm. important consideration <laughs> most important consideration is the comfort of the crew because even though i'm comfortable if it was gusting up to 40 knots the most important thing is comfort of the crew and that really has to do with the sea state so if it's a a, a glass lake and the waves, it's not making gigantic swells with short periods where the bow is burying itself, then 40 knots really isn't, I mean, it's going gonna, it's gonna to create some havoc on the, the water top for a short period of time, blowing water and spray and things like that. But it's not that 40 knots is bad. It's what 40 knots, 20 to 40 knots can do with the sea state. So you go from a two to three foot wave to a... a two to three meter wave. And so then the boat's pitching, the boat's rolling, and you've probably seen some of our videos where I know one video, Jen came above and said, hey, 
I can take this or I can take this. I can't take this. Pick <laughs> one, you know, just pick one and keep it that way. And so that's the biggest thing. And so as much of adventure as I want, eight, you know, you wouldn't know that it's not, you know, if it's Florida, it's got, you know, maybe birds or boats on it. And it's like, they don't know it's not a captain's license. Most of them don't speak English. They look at it. The most important thing for these European bureaucracies is that it has a number in it, um, a number that they can write down. Um, I have a Utah boater safety thing that I, I used to hand to them with a copy of my completion. I just printed offline from my Nautic Ed. And that's the one they like the most. It said, and I added a picture to it, and here's my captain's license. Um, and they don't ask questions. They look at it and go, oh, well, it looks official. It's got a number on it, right? And they write it down. So be prepared if you do come to Europe. They do expect some sort of licensing um, to be able to travel uh, through there. Unlike the United States where it's like, in the U.S., you got to have a pilot's license to fly an airplane, but for a boat, you know, most states just require a boater safety course. And so if you can show that you can, you've taken the boater safety course, you can legally register your boat and you can operate a boat above a certain age. So, yeah. So that's an answer to the captain's license. You kind of, sort of do need a captain's license in Europe. <laughs> okay. Randy asks, <laughs> in one of your videos, you mentioned the wind was 18 knots. What is the max wind you will sail in? Your answer is going to be different than mine, so you answer first. <laughs> oh, I hate it if it's above 25. 20 is good. 20 works. It gets us where we're going at a good speed. And, um, yeah, so. So my answer is it depends. Um, when we first started sailing this this boat, I had never sailed 36 foot. I had some experience in a 36 foot and a 25 foot. I'd never sailed something 50 feet. I mean, this thing is is uh, 17,000 kilos. It's a, pr a very heavy boat and big. Um, I didn't know what its capabilities were and I didn't know what my capabilities were in this boat. And so um, if you had asked me this question when we first started in Croatia, I would have said 15 knots is mm -hmm. probably, you know, that was scary for us back then. Now I would say I would be comfortable and I, I know the boat would be more comfortable than me in 40 knots with with just the head sail reefed a little bit of head sail out and we'd be making good time i think the most mm -hmm. important consideration <laughs> most important consideration is the comfort of the crew because even though i'm comfortable if it was gusting up to 40 knots the most important thing is comfort of the crew and that really has to do with the sea state so if it's a a, a glass lake and the waves, it's not making gigantic swells with short periods where the bow is burying itself, then 40 knots really isn't, I mean, it's gonna, it's gonna create some havoc on the, the water top for a short period of time, blowing water and spray and things like that. But it's not that 40 knots is bad, it's what 40 knots, 20 to 40 knots can do with the sea state. So you go from a two to three foot wave to a, a two to three meter wave. And so then the boat's pitching, the boat's rolling, and you've probably seen some of our videos where I know one video, Jen came above and said, hey, I can take this or I can take this. I can't take this, pick <laughs> one, you know, just pick one and keep it that way. And so that's the biggest thing. And so as much adventure as I want, I have to tailor that to, um, what we could actually handle physically as a crew and then you know considerations about the boat i don't want to beat the boat unnecessarily it is rough on the boat um in winds above 25 knots um but it but it doesn't hurt it it's just you're just taking away from longevity of the boat as the whole boat is is plowing through waves and there's a difference between if it's 40 knots and we're running down wind that's a completely different scenario than if we're a beating close hauled in 40 knots of wind completely different scenario um just different worlds uh when you're sailing and levels of comfort so yeah so in conclusion of that randy's question the max wind is 20 to 25 20 to 25 because even though maybe me or the boat can do more 
it's really the rest of the crew has a lot of input on how comfortable they want to be. And 20 to 25 knots is, that's a lot of wind and this boat will do nine, nine and a half, ten 10 knots depending on whether it's surfing and what angle of sail we have going. Yeah. Okay. So next question is uh, Claire asked about uh, Jen and the kids perspective on what we've learned from leaving a steady job, friends and family to travel the world. Um, even though Claire asked Jen and the kids' perspective, I'm going to add, um, there's nothing I lost from leaving my job, and I'd do it again in a heartbeat. Um, this this is family, and being here on Earth and exploring this beautiful Earth is the most important thing. Being involved in our environment and the people around us is the most important thing. It's not, I know you think it's that job you have that is not the important thing a job can be had again even if it's the greatest job in the world the blessings that will come from travel and spending more time with your family will greatly outweigh anything and the reason I say that is someday you will be on your deathbed um, never wishing you had spent more time at work your death wish will be that you wish you had traveled more and spent more time with loved ones and friends. That will be your dying wish. So Jen's perspective? Um, I think some of the important things that I've learned is that we've we learned to rely on each other a little bit more, to be there for each other, um, to kind of, we're in a close space. And so learning to identify um, when someone needs their a little time alone, some space, um, doing that for each other and um, learn to be a little more conservative in our spending and learning to appreciate stillness, not being busy, enjoying, um, yeah, stillness. That I really value that with all some of the crazy stuff we've been through and yeah it's nice not to be did you get some feedback really. from the kids on this one uh, they can answer that okay so we'll have the kids answer the question um, again I'll insert some little videos asking them the question right here the next question was what have we learned from leaving job friends and family Oh, no, you go. Why? <laughs> no, you go first this time. What? No, then back in. Okay. Whatever. Homeschool. Math mostly can be really, really sucky. It's like the only homeschool you do. <laughs> <laughs> you used to do other All homeschool. All of homeschool. Um, I've learned that you don't need a super high budget to go vacationing. And... I've also learned that it's when I want to go vacationing, I don't want a busy vacation like I feel like most people do, where they pack their schedule like with all these different things, because I like just kind of being there and, you know, eating new foods and, uh, I mean, doing the stuff tourists or whatever do, but just to a point. <laughs> um... Well, I've learned. So, before we <laughs> before we left, I was like, all my friends, I'm leaving all my friends. Oh no, torture. I'm going to die without what am I going to do without my friends, right? And it's it's not actually that bad. Like I'm still in contact with some of them, but I mean, it's like not Your friends feel hurt, Maddie. <laughs> <laughs> I, you can I, live without him. Yes, I can. <laughs> but I'm thankful for them in a lot of ways. So, yeah. I've also learned that ice cream from other countries tastes better. Yeah. Ooh, American yeah. ice cream is kind of sad after yeah. I've eaten ice cream from these other places. So. One more question that wasn't asked by others that I'm going to ask you, that I'm sure other people would think about. What would you say to other teenagers whose parents come to them and say, hey, we're going to go jump in an RV for a year, or we're going to go travel Europe for a year, or 90 days because of Schengen, <laughs> or we're going to buy a boat and go travel the Caribbean for a year. And they say, well, and they're like, you know, the typical, oh, 
all my friends, my school, my soccer, my ballet, and all of that stuff, what would you say to the kids that are presented with that, that thing from their parents? Just do it. It'll be okay. <laughs> no, I think I'm the wrong person to ask. The only thing I can say about that is leaving school is not that big of a deal. <laughs> uh, school's not that great. I had a lot of, you know, friends, and I basically went to school just to socialize. Um, yeah, so... <laughs> But it's <laughs> hey, you did the same thing. Listen, Maddie, what about I you two? What would you, what would advice you would you have too, to kids your age, whose parents just said we're gonna go travel for a year? But I'm not a teenager. Your age. <laughs> oh, I'm a tween still counts. Um, uh, I don't know, Maddie. <laughs> oh, I Maddie think what I've learned that. from her is that if you're leaving behind something like lessons or whatever you can still do them she gets videos from her clogging teacher and she does her reviews and stuff of her dances so she's still learning and working on that so she's not she didn't leave that behind maddie what advice would you <laughs> have what would you tell her I, I already gave my advice i don't have I, i'm said, not good with advice just do, just do it. it just, just do it okay do it. Mm -hmm. All right, next question. What do we eat most of the time? Um, fruit Loops. <laughs> we would eat Fruit Loops if we could find them. No, we but wouldn't. But we, we don't have Fruit Loops. <laughs> so our main fare is usually a pasta or rice dish, um, often without meat. Um, on occasion, we do add meat to the diet. And then salad when we have fresh food available. Um, so... Um, yeah, that's, that's mostly it. And we do have cereal on board. We have, you know, microwave popcorn since we've got a thing, you know, we have snacks and some junk food, but, um, uh, we do eat a lot of local bread. That's really yummy. The fresh breads you can get every day. Um, yeah, sandwiches, etc. So not too different than, um, what we used to eat. We do like to keep things familiar. Um, it's good for our digestion. <laughs> Would you say we eat? But sometimes we do try. We eat less things. processed food now. Less processed. Um, I don't know. We weren't too bad before. Yeah. So I can tell you, since since we've started the sailing journey, I have not been sick. I've had an upset stomach a couple times, but I haven't had a cold. Um, none of us, knock on wood. That's that's fake wood, but probably, but it works, right? Um, none of us have had COVID. Uh, all of us were originally vaccinated, but we've not had any boosters. And even with our exposure, with all of these areas that are very high in COVID, we've been blessed not to to have. None of us have contracted COVID that we know of. It might have been so so slight that we didn't know about it. But um, we eat um, a lot of fresh fruits and vegetables, and I think our proximity to markets really makes that easier a lot of these other european countries there's a lot of markets and so the produce i found in some of the local markets is fabulous you get some of the freshest food that's just so it's it's actually fun to eat some <laughs> we've been eating some interesting peaches they're like a squashed little peach thing that that actually tastes really good and um bananas and peppers and Melons. Uh, melons, yeah. Oh, really the melons, melons here are so good, and they have such a variety of them. Um, and yeah, the fresh breads are are incredible. And so, yeah, I I think we've all been a lot healthier because of of this diet. We're not, you know, a lot of picture or a lot of people when we first decided to come sailing would ask, "Well, how are you going to get your food?" Because they've envisioned us just sailing on the boat, never stopping. You know, we sail for a couple days. The longest passage we've been on so far is two days. Next passage, the longest, I think, will be three days when we go from Sardinia to Majorca. Um, but that's not very long. Any fresh food you have is going to last. So we don't eat a lot of canned foods um, just because we don't need to. We've got a lot of fresh foods to be able to eat. So I love it. Okay. Oh, and fresh fish. We caught a tuna, oh. and we have we love fresh lionfish ceviche ceviche or however you say that anyways it's raw chopped up fish with 
with lime and some other stuff, and it's incredibly yummy. And we're doing our part to rid the Mediterranean of <laughs> lionfish. If you're curious what lionfish can do to you, or at least what it did to me, here's another link for a video that uh, you'll find interesting. When I tangled with a lionfish before I had thick gloves and learned what uh, cobra venom feels like from that lionfish. So, yeah. Yeah, three stings, so it's not fun. Yep. All right, so someone asked, well, several of you asked about homeschooling. And so um, I did not purchase a curriculum. Um, we just got us some Saxon math books and did that for most of last year. And, um, and then we finished up using Khan Academy for their current grades. <clears throat> Maddie's just finished eighth and Lissa just finished fifth. And um, this week we'll begin sixth grade and ninth grade. Um, so our main focus is math, making sure they don't fall behind in that. And occasionally we have writing assignments, we memorize poems and scriptures, um, we do biology and marine biology. Um, let's see, I purchased a health program from the good and the beautiful that will start this year and yeah it's just a hodgepodge of what I feel they need right now and I think it's going good we do some history um, we do have the girls on occasion look up the current country that we're in and find some interesting facts to share with the family and um, yeah and then we go see all these ruins and things and try to share some history they're not entirely interested but um, so things like that that we do for school and I think all the little adventures that we do you know kind of play into that and then swimming and all the wonderful new and awesome creatures and plant life and things that we find under the water that's been really fun um, I think our favorite has been the octopus they've seen two now and that's so fun to watch it change and camouflage itself. But anyway, um, so homeschooling, we keep it pretty laid back. Um, and yeah, I think it's working. Yeah, I've, I've actually heard that some of the <clears throat> major uh, universities actually appreciate a, a student that brings that diversity to them. They've done something that, you know, maybe their academic scores aren't as great, but they they could bring something to university from life experiences. and. That's what these kids are getting is a life experience that most kids will never experience. <clears throat> Excuse me. So there's a lot of kids that have never traveled outside the United States that um, don't know what other languages sound like or have participated in other cultures or had to dress a certain way because you need to worry about offending um, a different a different culture or um, make sure you, you don't say a certain thing or a certain gesture or things like that. So... Um, the kids are learning a lot. It's, it's uh, I would say, the school of life. And so don't get so wrapped up on what uh, curriculum the students or, or your kids need. Um, they're going to have a lot of experiences that will make up for that. And like Jen says, you know, having that, keeping up with the math, I think is the most important thing they won't learn out here um, and writing skills. And, you know, as long as you don't come from a, a crazy state, <coughs> California, um, you know, that has all kinds of regulations about you can't take your kid to homeschool or if you do you know they've got to pass this test or this test they're going to come back and be uh, accepted back into any school um, and they won't even have skipped a beat nobody will know the difference so yeah okay so so that's homeschooling so checking in and out of countries we talked about the the documentation needed uh, to check in and out of the countries and sometimes it's an adventure um, we, we've learned to try and find an area closest to uh, the port of entry. Um, you can go to noon site and it has a list of all the ports of entry. And you have to go into a port of entry because if you just go to a normal port, they don't have the facilities, the uh, port police and customs and, and uh, port authorities uh, to be able to stamp your passport and to do the in-processing paperwork into the countries. 
So most of Europe, if you stay in the Schengen company countries, like when we went to Greece and checked in, <coughs> like when we went to Greece and checked in, uh, we went from Greece to Italy, and when we showed up at uh, Reggio Calabria, um, and I tried to get the guy to stamp our passports, he just kind of he showed up on his moped in his blue jeans. And he looked at our passport and said, where'd you come from? Greece. He opened the passport. He saw that we were stamped into Greece. He says, no. Nope, no needed. No. And I said, yeah, but the, online it says we need this we need this boat document to be able to travel through Italy. And uh, we need our passport stamped and we need this and that. And he says, no, no, no. So it was amazing going. And, and I thought, well, this is going to cause a problem when we check out. And when we went to check out, I went to the port police. They said, no, you need to go to the immigration police in town. Okay, so I went to the immigration police in town, filled out a couple of sheets of paperwork, handed it to them. Fifteen minutes later, they stamped our passports. <clears throat> we said were cleared. We could go. Said we could go. So it's like it varies greatly. Even when one country has a rule, it really depends which location you're checking into. And it really, really is important to be polite and respectful because people will make your checking in and checking out process as easy as possible if they know and understand that you're trying to be respectful, you're trying to be polite. Um, if you go in there high and mighty and say, I'm a U.S. citizen, you got to let me in your country and and uh, yell at the guy because they're taking too long and talk about their stupid paperwork and their stamps and bureaucracy, then you're going to have a really hard time in some of these countries. So you just have to be patient and respectful. Um, so have all the documentation. We talked about that. The boat registration, and boat insurance, uh, the crew list with all the important information and your captain's license. Some some people have asked for a radio license for the boat. That's just, I think, Montenegro and uh, maybe one other country cared about that. Most people don't, don't even care about that. Um, and uh, so we get into a port, the process. We fly the quarantine flag with the country flag um, to show them that we're, we're we're telling them, hey, we haven't checked into your country yet. We'll either anchor in the bay or go to a marina because sometimes the marinas will help take care of the in-processing uh, paperwork or provide you with the paperwork. Um, and then we, and then we usually show up at. Uh, we start with the port police because they're the first ones. Um, if they have a customs dock, you have to go to the customs dock uh, most times. So we'll tie up to the customs dock. When you walk on shore, port police is usually the first place. They'll check your passports. They'll check your crew list. Then you take all the documentation to the uh, port authorities, like the uh, port master, harbor master. Uh, harbor master. Um, and then, um, then you go to customs. And normally there's, depending on the country, there's a, like a, a process that kind of winds its way around. So port police, then to uh, harbor master, then to customs, then maybe back to the harbor master to show you've been to customs, and then back to port police, and then they'll, the final step is when they're stamping your passport. So when they show that all the documentation's been collected and everything. So that's the, the process. And then leaving is the same thing. Uh, they want to collect the paper that you had that showed where you've been in the country and gives you authorization to be in that country with your boat. Normally, they'll take that back, some type of cruising permit. Um, and, and that does come with a fee. Uh, Greece, you pay per month. Um, Italy charged absolutely nothing. Uh, Tunisia charged absolutely five dinars, which is like $1.75. Um, and some of the other countries are, are a little more expensive. Uh, um, Turkey, I think, was 200 euros for 90 days, um, and it really depends on the country. But just just be prepared to be patient, be respectful, and the uh, check-in process will, will go well. Uh, noon site's got a lot of information. Uh, we do use Navali heavily because other people have been there. Uh, we Navali will designate a lot of people in the comments will say this is a great place to check in and out. It was such an easy process. And then you can actually contact and chat with other sailors um, through chat sessions through Navali and say, hey, what was it like checking in and out of that country? Um, great resource. We love Navali. Um, and if you'd like to sponsor us, Navali, let us know. We'll, we'll talk more about you. Um, let's see. And then um, we talked about checking out, just leaving the country. And 
you know, technically you could just leave the country, but you may not ever be able to come back into the country again, ever, including if you want to go back on vacation. So if we didn't check out of Italy and I went back to the U.S., and then I'm traveling through Europe and I arrive at a border in Italy and they look at my passport, they will show that I never checked out of Italy and that can cause some problems and for future travel. So do it right, make sure you get checked in and out of each, each country. Um, there's Schengen here in, I guess I should talk about that, yeah, Schengen. Schengen is, uh, I can sum it in a quick sentence, Europe for Europeans. So what it did is the Schengen rules made it so Europeans can travel all throughout the Schengen countries without limitation with their, with their driver's license. They don't need passports. They don't need to go the passport process and all of that. It made it easier for Europeans to travel. What it did for someone who isn't a European is made it that all of the countries in Schengen, which is basically all of the countries in Europe, save some exception. Croatia, which is going Schengen next year next year uh albania is not schengen montenegro. montenegro is not schengen and turkey's not schengen and tunisia that's why we're in tunisia here's how schengen works if you're other than a european citizen when you come to any of the european countries you're stamped in on your passport you now have 90 days in a six month period to be able to enjoy all of the european countries so the old days when you could grab a backpack, start in Spain, and travel all the way down to Italy and spend a year doing it, you can't do it. You absolutely cannot do it. There are exceptions if you want to winter over, where uh, Marina de Ragusa will help you get an Italian pseudo-residency for the winter to extend that. But, but other than those certain particular instances, um, yeah, if you're not European, we... Europe doesn't want you here spending your money for more than 90 days. They want you to go home uh, because if you have lots of money to spend, go home and spend it somewhere else the rest <laughs> of the, the, the 90 days in the six-month period, and then we'll take you back. So Europe, you need to work on that because I think sailors should be exempt from Schengen and travelers who can prove that they have money. They're not there to just leech. They have a valid passport from a good country that says hey i have a job i'll start a bank account let me travel in your country for a year because there's so much to see in europe it is so such a beautiful diverse area of the world that schengen is just a wrecking ball for for tourists trying to enjoy it i'm sorry there's my schengen soapbox i'm done <laughs> i'm done yeah so we we have about 60 days on our schengen time and so that's why we came down here to um, have some of those early days in Schengen start falling off so that we can spend some time in Gibraltar. No, Gibraltar doesn't count in Schengen. No. So Sardinia, but Sardinia, Spain. and then Spain, and then the Canaries, and still have Schengen days. So, yeah, it's tricky. We call it the Schengen Shuffle. Um, yeah. A lot of people struggle with it, and have to find these little spots that let them stay all right so our next question is how did we learn to sail and in a really short sentence by doing it actually he's the sailor we just follow instructions because i don't get sailing <laughs> and don't let them fool you they're learning but uh, definitely before we do our atlantic crossing they're all going to be proficient in adjusting uh, the sails. Don't give me that look. <laughs> Even you're going to get good at it. So that when they're on shift, they don't have to keep waking the captain up. And we're actually taking on uh, a crew member um, in Gibraltar. Uh, she's a young lady that's done a lot of sailing and she's looking for adventure. And so uh, we found her through uh, a crew site. And we're going to take her on so that we can have additional, uh, not necessarily qualified, but uh, trained crew or experienced crew that can mm -hmm. help with shifts so that if something goes wrong, they, they don't have to wake the captain up. The captain can keep sleeping during the 21-day Atlantic crossing, <laughs> three weeks or however long it's going to take. So we did, we owned a 25-foot Catalina. Uh, we owned a 25-foot Catalina. We've also owned a 36-foot Catalina, uh, both for short periods of time. Um, so I did have a little experience. And, and I'm a pilot, so uh, sailing is like 
flying. I mean, you're just working with a big wing and the wing is vertical instead of horizontal. Um, and then there's that, that relationship that, that you just have with the boat that you can feel what it's doing. You can uh, tell how it's reacting to the wind. Um, you just you feel it you just know that that things are set right and i'm still learning um we might be in 15 knots of wind in this boat on a beam reach and 15 18 knots of wind should be doing its hull speed which is about nine knots and i i can't get it there uh, so i'm still learning um to be able to tweak the sails and things like that. And so that's, it's a learning process, but don't let that stop you from doing this adventure. You know, um, I didn't know how to park a 50 foot boat uh, in a marina until we bought this boat. And then the first time they turned me loose with it, I'm like, okay, here we go. That's so what, scary. <laughs> yeah, it was so scary. But after a while, it's like, okay, I still get a little tense when we're, we're parking in tight spots with lots of ropes and lines around, but, and wind and wind um, that's the biggest thing but you know it, it's not as bad as it used to be and it just gets easier and easier and again learning what I would have done with this boat early on is not what I would have, would do with it now what I'm comfortable doing with it now and so uh, learning to sail is a process so if you buy a boat um, you don't have to everybody says oh buy a small one beat it to death you know get a boat that you're comfortable with get somebody on board that can help you handle it uh, the first couple times usually sometimes the brokers will do that with you uh, the first couple times or buy the boat hire a captain and do your YSA or ASA or RYA sailing course with them on your boat and that's a great way to to learn about your boat but basically just do it do it do it do it <laughs> all right future plans well I'm hoping and praying that the family uh, minus Rebecca, she's going to jump ship when we get to Puerto Rico um, with her siblings that are meeting us there for Christmas and go. Um, I was hoping that everybody would fall in love with this um, and that we could just continue to the Pacific Ocean. Um, of course, there's funding issues. Uh, we're so thankful for our patrons uh, who support us now. Um, but it's really not enough to keep us going. The budget uh, we did budget for a year, and that's what we're coming up on and, unless we get more patrons. Um, so unless uh, unless they f fall in love with it greatly, we'll do the Caribbean after we get there after Christmas and enjoy uh, maybe the British and uh, U.S. Virgin Islands and Martinique and maybe some areas like that, and then possibly sail the boat to Texas. If after the Atlantic crossing, Jen's like, okay, that wasn't as bad. We could do this for another year or more. I don't know. Then, then we'll continue. Uh, really, it's 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 the the kitchen pass. How long the kitchen pass lasts? Uh, whether or not we can get home to see the grandkids, spend some time with family members. We've got some elderly parents um, to care for, um, and then the budget, of course. Um, worst case scenario. Um, we get back, everybody just abandon ship as soon as they see land, continental United States, they jump off like rats from a sinking ship and I'm left alone to sell the boat and we move back to suburbia. But we'll have completed an incredible journey and that's many, many months, moons from now. It's a long period of time between now and Christmas and through the spring in the Caribbean. So yeah, so we'll see. We'll see. We'll see. So stay with us. We don't know what's going to happen. Who knows if if Jen falls in love with it and uh, we can afford it and she can get a catamaran. then Or if you want to donate a catamaran. If you have a catamaran that you'd like to donate to us <laughs> when we get to the Caribbean, um, maybe I can talk Jen into to staying longer. So we'll see. Yeah. So right now, the girls and I, we've I think we've had a good experience. And we see some, the value of this year and a half. Um, well, not quite year and a half. Um, journey that we've been on, but we don't love it like he does. And um, like he said, there, we will still have had this time 
whether we return to land or not and it will be a great memory for us so right now the girls and I plan to go back home we need to spend some time with the parents and grandparents uh, siblings grandkids we have yeah sure, and yeah. the girls miss their friends so um, we will we will see we shall see mash potato that like button thanks for watching and uh, stay tuned we've got some crazy adventures coming up on the next few videos uh, traveling through continuing through on through Greece Italy and coming down here to Tunisia and then these videos are going to continue all the way through the Atlantic crossing in the Caribbean again don't forget to put your questions down below uh, hit that uh, down arrow so you can look at the comments see where, where we got the music if you like any of the songs where you can pick them up yourself if you'd like to join our patreon crew there's the link there for that um, there's a link if you want to buy us a soda or lunch or give us a catamaran there's the email address down there <laughs> um, it'll be much appreciated and yeah so again thanks for watching and we look forward to having you with you on the journey make sure you uh, uh, be good and do great things all right so Dane asks our travel well, what is it what is the actual question our travel to Croatia what was the tra you know how did we travel to Croatia why did we oh, choose okay. Croatia okay. and how did we find our okay. boat so Dane asks about our travel to Croatia and how I can't even. Okay, and how did we Dane, find our boat? So Dane asks, what would the travel to Croatia was like? Why we decided to go to Croatia? Question. So I should read it. So please read it. it. I Just. Mean, I don't want to look at the paper and read it. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so I'm trying to get. Our travel to Croatia. Okay. How we traveled okay. to. Why we choose to travel to Croatia and how we chose our boat. Okay. Only one of you should hold a pillow. It's fine. Sit, sit up pillow straight. Down, Becca. Okay, then at least sit up straight. Okay. Now I look short. No, you don't. Really? No. Hey, Jordan, Rebecca, <laughs> you go first. Hey, Jordan, that way. Yeah. Uh, oh, wait, wait. I'll, Arizona. Look, we should save the best one for last. Arizona. Which yeah, is you don't need to me. What? Uh, no. Repeat the question. <laughs> or you can repeat it to yourself if. So, okay, you I'll ask to. the question. You guys can answer, and then I'll answer. You can and then the you can ask now. the next Perfect, question. Perfect, yeah. Okay, there's only two questions. Yeah. You say, yeah. Are we, said, are we, by the way. Yeah, don't touch the table. You were recording. Don't touch and, the table. Oh, wait, do and we have say to say Mark's, Mark wait, asked. Do we have to yeah. say Mark, Mark asked? No, because we already asked that in the video, and we're just going to insert your answers into the section we did. Well, so it's going to be like, Mark asked, blah, 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 blah. No. And Claire asked, blah, blah, blah. And so then it's the gonna video go, going to go, and yeah, we're going to do Okay. Oh. Say, so, okay. <laughs> Make sure you said that. Everybody say goodbye. Bye. Everybody say goodbye. Wave goodbye. Bye. Bye. Happy smiley goodbyes. Bye. I don't understand why we have to say goodbye. I miss you.